Jars of Hope, How One Woman Helped Save 2,500 Children During the Holocaust. Written by Jennifer Roy, illustrated by Meg Owenson. Otwock, Poland, 1917. Irina noticed things. She noticed that some people were treated differently than others. Sometimes, Irina's father took her with him on his doctor's visits. The children in the neighborhood where he treated patients spoke Yiddish. They also went to the Jewish temple. Irina heard the mean things that others said about the Jewish people. Most people in her neighborhood stayed away from the Jewish neighborhoods. Irina often played with the Jewish children. Papa, Irina asked, are some people really better than others? Irina, her beloved father said, there are two kinds of people in this world good and bad. It doesn't matter if they are rich or poor, what religion or race. What matters is if they are good or bad. Irina's father died when she was only seven years old, but his wise words did not die with him. They lived on in Irina's heart. Warsaw, Poland, 1940. Irina wanted to be a good person. She helped poor families in Warsaw. She took a job as a social worker. In 1939, Germany had invaded Poland. Germany's leader, Adolf Hitler, led the Nazi party. He believed Jewish people were unequal to the Germans. World War II had begun. I'm here to give people vaccines, said Irina. She was entering the Warsaw Ghetto. By 1940, Germans had forced almost 500,000 Polish Jews to move into this space within the city. It was less than 2 square miles, or 5.2 square kilometers. A tall brick wall topped with barbed wire and shards of glass surrounded the ghetto. The Germans had told the Polish people a lie. They were not allowed to enter the ghetto because they'd catch diseases. Go in, said the soldier. We don't want sickness spreading against these walls. Irina was frightened at first, but she had seen how badly the Nazis treated the Jews. She was worried about all of the people trapped in the ghetto simply because of their religion. Miss, do you have any food? A child called to Irina. My baby is sick, a woman pleaded. Please, can you help? There are so many people in need, thought Irina. What can one person do? Irina thought of something her father had told her. When someone is drowning, he had said, give him your hand. The children are hurting the most, she decided. I have to give them a helping hand. Arena talked to friends she could trust. We can sneak food and medicine into the ghetto, Arena told them, if we are very careful. It will be dangerous, said her friend Yaga Piotrowska. If the Nazis catch us, they may kill us. So will you do it? Arena asked. Of course, Yaga responded. Arena and her helpers bravely began sneaking food, medicine, and other aid into the ghetto. But soon their mission became more urgent and even more dangerous. Starting in July 1942, German soldiers forced more than 6,000 Jewish people per day into cattle cars on trains. The Jews had no idea where they were going. The trains took took them to Treblinka, a place where the Nazis would put them to death. Irina organized. Irina had many helpers. One was a truck driver named Antoni. He was allowed to drive the truck in and out of the ghetto. The first time he and Irina tried to sneak out a baby in the truck, the baby cried. The German soldiers at the gate almost caught them. The next time Irina brought a child to the truck, she found a surprise. There was a large dog in the front seat. This is Shepsy, Antoni said. She's quiet, talented, and is well-trained. We don't need to worry about the baby in the back crying, he whispered. The truck inched its way to the border gate and stopped. From the back, the baby began to wail. The guard came closer. Oh no, thought Irina. Surely we will be caught. But then, Antony tapped Shepsy's paw. The big dog began barking, which made the soldier's dogs bark too. The loud dogs drowned out the baby's cries, and the guard let the truck pass through the ghetto gates. July 18th, 1942. Irina knocked on a door. When the door opened, she took a deep breath and walked in. It is time, she said. Hania Koppel gently placed her baby girl into Irina's carpenter's toolbox. Irina looked down at baby Bieta, her innocent face, 
Her tiny body snuggled into the blanket she was wrapped in. The baby smiled. Arena put a dropper of medicine into Bieta's mouth to make her sleepy. She fixed the blanket, making sure the box's air holes were clear. As Arena began to close the box, the baby's grandfather quickly slipped something inside. It was a small, silver spoon marked with the baby's name and birthday. Elisabetta, 5 January 1942. A gift from her mama and papa, he said, wiping tears from his eyes. Arena took a deep breath. She stepped out into the Warsaw ghetto, carrying her precious cargo. Arena knocked on more doors. Please let your child go with me, Arena begged. I will do my best to save him. What promise can you give us that our child will live? The parents asked Arena. I can only guarantee that if your child stays here, he will die. Arena answered. When the parents agreed to let their child go, Arena had to make a decision. What was the best way to rescue this child? Your child is small, Arena told the parents of the youngest ones. We will smuggle her out inside a potato sack, inside a coffin, or underneath the trash in a cart. Arena spoke directly to the older children she rescued. Be brave, she said. From this moment, your name is not Isaac, it is Piotr. Say your new name over and over until you believe you are Piotr. Then you must quickly memorize the Lord's Prayer. You are now a Catholic child. Piotr learned and practiced the Lord's Prayer, making the sign of the cross as he spoke it. Good, said Arena. Now you are ready. Follow me. They hurried into the courthouse that straddled the border of the ghetto. Arena made Piotr change out of his old clothes and into new, fresh ones. Then they walked through the back door, which led outside the ghetto to safety. Other times, Arena's helpers were busy underground. The helpers, called liaisons, led the Jewish children through the maze of sewer tunnels to freedom and safety. November 1942 Arena joined Zagoda. Zagoda was a secret group of brave Polish men and women that wanted to aid and rescue Jews. Arena would be in charge of helping the Jewish children. She and her network continued sneaking children out of the ghetto every day. But where did the children go? Arena found many brave people to take in the children. There were foster families who agreed to keep the smaller children. Some children went to Polish orphanages. Others went to convents where nuns took care of them. Everyone knew that if they were caught hiding a Jewish child, they would be put to death. But these courageous people risked their own lives to save the children. They knew it was the right thing to do. Arena kept records. Not only did Arena and her helpers rescue children, they made sure each child was safe and well cared for. Arena and her helpers delivered money, supplies, and food to the foster families who cared for the children. The children are in good hands now, Arena told her friend Yaga, but when the war ends, they will need to be reunited with their parents. I have been keeping lists of the children's real names along with their new names and where they are. Me too, said Yaga. If the Nazis find the list, they may kill us and hunt down the children and their caregivers. Every child deserves to know her real name, Arena insisted, and the children's families will want to find them. But you're right, it is very dangerous, and we need to be careful. Arena's apartment, October 20th, 1943. Arena was caught. She always knew that saving children came with great risk. Her greatest fear was about to come very real. Bang! 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 Open up! A man shouted, pounding on the door. It's the Descapo, Arena whispered. Arena grabbed her list and went to the window to throw them outside, but there were more secret police waiting out there. The building was surrounded. Bang! Bang! Arena desperately tossed the list of names at Janina, a friend who was staying with her. Janina stuck the list under her arm beneath her clothing. Then Arena opened the door. Gestapo police swarmed into the room. They tore apart Arena's home, but they did not find the lists. They did, however, take Arena away. Powaik Prison, October 1943. Arena went to prison. Powaik Prison was a place where the Gestapo questioned and punished anyone who broke Nazi law. Tell us what you know about Zagata, the Gestapo policeman demanded. I don't know anything, Arena replied. I'm just a social worker. The man lashed Arena's legs and feet, first with a whip, then with a strap, but Arena stayed silent. 
Arena's days were always the same. In prison, Arena worked 12 hours a day scrubbing laundry. Then she was questioned and beaten for not giving up the names of her Zagoda friends. She got very little food. Hunger and pain kept her from getting a good night's sleep. Days turned into months. Three months. Powaiak Prison, January 1944. Arena's name was called. Arena Sendler? A guard yelled. Arena was pushed into a truck with other women crammed inside. They were taken to Gestapo, Gestapo headquarters. We will be put to death, Arena thought. I am proud I did not give up any information. I am not afraid to die. Arena was pushed into a room and fell on her knees. An officer pulled her up and led her through a door. You are free, the officer said in Polish. Get out of here as fast as you can. Arena limped and stumbled on her damaged legs and feet down an alleyway. The sun came out from behind a cloud. Arena was blinded for a moment. She had not seen the sun for one hundred days. Arena hid. Zagoda had paid the officer a lot of money to free Arena, but now she had to go into hiding because the Nazis believed she was dead. Arena hid in friends' houses. For a few days, she even hid in the Warsaw Zoo, sleeping in a cage with baby foxes. But she continued her work with Zagoda, and thanks to her friend, she still had the list of children she had saved. Late summer, 1944. Arena hid the lists. The Warsaw Uprising had begun. There was fighting in the streets. Arena wanted to make sure her list would be safe, even if something happened to her. At midnight, midnight one night, she and Yaga tiptoed outside Yaga's house to the backyard. The friends dug into the hard ground with a knife and spoon. Arena lowered three jars into the hole and covered them with soil. The lists were safe, jars of names, jars of hope. Afterward. After the war's end, Arena's lists were given to an organization that was helping connect survivors with their families. Sadly, most of the children's parents had died, but a few were alive and were able to find their children because of Arena's lists. Some children learned of their real history and their parents' brave decision to give them up to save their lives. And still, others remembered Arena herself, courageous and comforting, leading them to freedom. Years later, people would ask, Arena, why did you do it? Why did you risk your life to save Jewish children? Under Jewish occupation, Arena responded, I saw the Polish nation drowning, and those in the most difficult position were the Jews, and those who needed the most help were the children, so I had to help. On May 12, 2008, Arena was eating breakfast with her friend Bietta. It was the same Bietta who, as a baby, was carried out of the ghetto in a toolbox. The grown-up Bietta had lost her parents in the war, but she still had the spoon to remember them by. Arena, now aged 98, was in a good mood and the two friends chatted. Arena closed her eyes and peacefully died. Arena Sendler was honored by Yad Vishem, the Jewish people's living memorial to the Holocaust in Israel. She was presented with a medal inscribed with the words, Whosoever saves a single life saves an entire universe. Arena never thought of herself as a hero. Let me first say that I had many helpers, Arena said. The world should never forget them. It is not true that this was a historic act, only a simple and natural need of the heart.